it's a bit like, as I always say to students, it's a bit like riding a bike, learning to ride a bike. You can read all the books about riding the bike. You can listen to people talk about how to ride a bike, but until you get on the bike and actually ride it yourself, you'll never learn to ride a bike. The same with a commercial awareness. Hello everyone and welcome to the Student Lawyer podcast series. Whether you're at school, sick form, university, thinking about a career in law or exploring law careers, you're in the right place. We are the one-stop shop for student lawyers. If you'd like to join the Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com. This episode is sponsored by the University of Law. What really sets the University of Law apart from other universities is its belief that its students should learn in a realistic, professional and contemporary context. They focus exclusively on practice-based training and give students access to their extensive career service and jobs vacancy database as soon as they accept a place with them. Through the University of Law's pro bono programme, law students can hone their skills by working on real cases before they graduate. The University of Law offers a range of postgraduate legal training and master's degrees designed by qualified experts to help students advance at any stage of their career. Their courses are employment focused, honing key skills in a teaching environment based on real legal practice. Part-time and online study options are also available on many of their courses to help students work and study at the same time. To find out more about the courses on offer, click the link in the description box of the podcast. Hello everybody, welcome to today's episode of the Student Lawyer Podcast. My name is Stephanie and I am the host of today's show. On the episode today, I'm joined by Dennis Viskovich. Dennis is a dual qualified Australian and English lawyer with over 20 years of experience working for investment banks and companies in the City of London and Mayfair. He is also the founder of the British Inter-University Commercial Awareness Competition, the largest commercial awareness competition for law students from the non-Russell group of universities in the United Kingdom, as well as the founder of Future City Lawyers, an educational programme and online platform which teaches legal commercial awareness to future city lawyers. On the show today, Dennis shares with us his career journey and explains what an in-house lawyer at an investment bank involves, the importance of having commercial awareness and how to get it, and the wonderful initiatives that he has launched, such as Bucac and Future City Lawyers. But before we start today's episode, we would love for you to follow us wherever you get your podcasts from. The more followers we have, the larger audience we reach and this means we can help more student lawyers secure their dream job. Also don't forget to leave us a rate and review on iTunes for the chance to have a shout out on the show and that reminds me we would love to give a big shout out to Vic Wilson. Vic said that the podcast is a great way to learn about the legal industry and is the go-to podcast for every aspiring lawyer. Hi Dennis welcome to the student lawyer podcast it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me Stephanie. It is a pleasure and I've been really looking forward to this episode for a very long time now so I'm very excited to have you here. So why don't we get started with uh, just hearing about your career journey to date. So as you know Stephanie I'm Australian I've been here 20 years I'm a dual qualified Australian and English lawyer. Uh, I arrived here many years ago you know as lots of Australians do to come here and experience living in London and working in London. So I, I qualified in Australia as a solicitor I went to university in Australia. I ended up working for uh, my training or training contract at a uh, Parker and Parker, which was a sort of, I would say, one of the leading law firms in Australia at that point, and now a part of Freehills. And now that's part of Herbert Smith Freehills. And so um, I did, I, I finished my training there, and then I traveled to London. And you know, being an Australian coming to London, I didn't quite understand what the city of London did. Of course, I knew a little bit about it, but I had no idea what it was about. And fortunately for me, I got a job at an investment bank and I wasn't I wasn't particularly aiming at an investment bank, but I got an investment, I got a job at an investment bank as a in-house lawyer. And that opened my eyes to a whole different world. I mean, you know, day one, I was dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars on deals, which, you know, of course, I'd never been exposed to that sort of level. 
dealing with investment bankers uh, and, and all the bankers that go with that and the clients, uh, who high profile clients, big companies, governments, uh, all that sort of thing. And so um, the aim was really to stay for a few years and then go back, to be honest. But what happened was I, I, I came just at the right time when the economy started taking off. And of course, uh, uh, I got promoted, I got bigger bonuses, and of course that carrot at the end of the year got bigger and bigger, uh, and I just thought maybe one more year, maybe one more year, and so 20 years later, here I am still here, so I'm you know clearly not going back, I'm going to stay, because obviously I enjoy it. And so I mainly spent most of my career in investment banking as a, as a lawyer, working up to become head of legal of one of the legal departments, uh, mainly concentrating on, uh, we'll talk about a little later of what I did, and then ended up working with some a very wealthy family here in London, and then, and then ended up a few years ago leaving and uh, started lecturing at different universities. We can talk about that a little bit later. What a fantastic career journey. I, I just think it, it is very inspiring, everything that you have done and accomplished. Um, and it all sounds very, very exciting. Um, I must say, I, I would have probably given up the Australian sun and the weather for this exciting career that you have um, had and still have. Uh, but would you just uh, go on to explain the reasons why you did decide to pursue a career in commercial law? So, you know, of course, I, you know, I do miss the Australian sun and of course I miss my family and my friends, my university friends. But on the other side, as you said, I've, you know, I've, I've had some amazing experiences. I've worked on massive deals in Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, uh, Middle East, South Africa, Eastern Europe, the Nordic countries. And I've met, you know, some high ranking people and intellectual people, some C big CEOs of some of the largest companies in the world. You know, that was an amazing thing. And, you know, at one point I was traveling to Moscow quite on a weekly basis. And of course, but the problem with that is, is when you are working in the city, whether in a city law firm or as I was in an investment bank, as a lawyer, it is high, high intensity, high, long hours, very intense, because of course, when the deal is on and the deal has to complete next Thursday and there's $100 million on the table, the client expects you, both your client, your bankers, everybody in the deal expects you to finish on time because mm -hmm. the client needs that money. So it is extremely high pressure. So to answer your question, um, there comes a point in time where you just think, you know, I've done it, I've seen it, I've really enjoyed it, I would like my weekends back. And so uh, four years ago, I made the dramatic decision to, uh, uh, to leave the city and uh, do something different. And I'm going to be honest, when I took that decision, a lot of my friends said to me, are you crazy? What are you doing? Why are you getting on? Why are you leaving? I just think I had to... I had to try something else and I just wanted to, I wanted to, as I said, I wanted some, I wanted my weekends back and I wanted some normality back in my life. And, and not, not, not to say that that's always the case. I'm not saying that you'll be working all the time, but there comes a time you need to try something different. And so um, I then tried to do something different and, and ended up being a, a lecturer at university on this, on this commercial awareness topic. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's great when you have um, a really fulfilling career and a job that you are in love with and, you know, going to work is very exciting and you have all these opportunities like you have done or had. Um, yet still having that inkling that you now know or think it's time to move on and try something new, it still very takes a lot of bravery I think to make that transition even though you think you know it's the right time um you're clearly very kind of decisive and know what is right and you correct me if I'm wrong but it sounds like you really kind of like go with your gut as well as thinking stuff through of course true, um, but true. It, I think it's great that you are able to make those decisions uh, that have taken you from a very exciting fulfilling career and now you're able to help um, other people also harness the the same. So you hit the nail on the head, Stephanie. I, I felt it was time for me to give something back. And actually, I was going to go to Africa and do some charity work, for, you know, have a bit of a break, because I, I made a mistake. I went straight for university. I finished, and I finished the Friday. 
and I started work on the Monday after my exams. I started work on Monday to do my training contract. Uh, and, you know, I don't regret that. I mean, I went, as I said, I went straight through and didn't have a break. And I just thought it's time for a break. So uh, before we do move on to really understanding what commercial awareness is and how um, students can obtain it, could you just firstly explain uh, what your legal career within the investment banking industry involved and what was, I mean, you've kind of touched on your reasons for leaving the corporate world to teach commercial awareness, but if there was any, any real trigger point. So I think that's very that's a very good question, Stephanie. A lot of students uh, obviously uh, focus on law firms, and correctly so. And but they forget that most of the clients, big clients for law firms, will actually be big companies and medium-sized companies and governments. And who will they be dealing with on a daily basis at those clients when they're taking instructions and working on the deal or the transaction? Is actually in-house lawyers, in-house lawyers, and in-house lawyers are, I think. Uh, uh, they do a fantastic job for companies and governments they work for. And so what, what my job was in this in the investment bank is that in-house lawyers are there to provide advice to the bank, to the bankers who are doing the transaction. But I was more transactional. My job was to make sure that all the legal documents involved with that transaction, and mainly I was doing debt capital markets. So I was mainly doing bonds, euro bond deals. But if it was an equity deal or IPO, your role is to make sure that the, that the transaction completes on time and that all the legal documents are negotiated and, and done properly to make sure that you protect the bank, to make sure that you protect the bank, whatever, whatever legal documents the banks are entering into, that you are there negotiating those documents, that you're helping with, the, with your client and the bank in fulfilling and making sure that transaction completes on time and that you are there to protect the bank. That's the major job of in-house lawyers. And in-house lawyers know that best because in-house lawyers work with their bankers and they know what risks the bank is prepared to take or not prepared to take. Private practice lawyers can give advice and of course they are part of the team and they are used by in-house lawyers to provide advice and also to provide transactional assistance. You know, a big Eurobond deal or a big IPO deal involves many, many lawyers drafting the prospectus, doing due diligence, negotiating the documents. And unfortunately, you know, in-house departments are not that big. So we do not have hundreds of lawyers able to do that. That's why we instruct law firms to assist us to do that. thing. But of course, we take the lead in negotiation and we understand the, uh, the, the, the red lines of the bank. It's very hard for a private practice lawyer to understand what our risk appetite is. And that's where I think in-house lawyers uh, advise both uh, the, the client and make sure that the bank is fully protected. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very, I think an in-house legal career is a very interesting career for any student who wants to think about that. Because the one benefit of that is that you're working very closely with the business people or the investment bankers in my case. You get to know about the transaction. You get to know about what the bank or the company does much. And you, as I said, you work much, much closer with them. Sounds really interesting. And I think it just highlights, it, it kind of highlights how solicitors and lawyers work in a team and how communication is so important. If there's all these different kind of um, people or departments that, you know, one single um, transaction has to go through, people need to be able to, you know, communicate with each other. Um, so leading on to my next question, why why did you decide to break into um, you know teaching commercial awareness? But perhaps you would like to just firstly explain uh, what commercial awareness is for our listeners that aren't quite sure. Okay, so let's talk about commercial awareness. Commercial awareness is is key for you to do well in interviews for vacation schemes or training contracts. In fact, I'll go even further and say that, you know, every single law firm I've talked to and been involved in has some element of commercial awareness in their assessment center or in the interview stage of the uh, vacation scheme or training contract uh, process. In fact, some law firms exclusively only test you on, on commercial awareness in terms of the assessment center. And then obviously the interviews have other topics involved in that. So to be able to do well in an assessment center for a vacation scheme or a training contract, you have to have commercial awareness. You have to be proficient and knowledgeable about it. That goes on to your career. You know, a good commercial lawyer 
is a much better commercial lawyer if they have commercial awareness. And so what is commercial awareness? Commercial awareness is, in, a, in essence, understanding what the transaction is about. What is your client trying to achieve? Clearly, your client is trying to make profit. That's the ultimate goal of any commercial transaction. But it goes further than that. How are they doing that? What is the rationale for the transaction? And this is where a lot of students don't understand what, what is key. You, as a commercial lawyer, have to identify all the risks because all commercial transactions carry risk. Otherwise, if it was risk-free, that would they would we would all be doing it. I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be doing a trade. So all trades, all transactions, all uh, either be it M and A, IPO, bond deal, they all carry risk. And your uh, job in a transaction is to identify all the risks, and preferably just the legal risk, but it'd be very good if you could do the commercial risk because that would be impressed your client. So your commercial and legal risks and then advise your client on how to either mitigate those risks or pass those risks onto the counterparty so that your client is protected. So it's about, it's about understanding what's going on. What is the commercial objective? What is the commercial purpose of the transaction? Identifying all their commercial and legal risks and providing legal advice to your client as to how to mitigate or minimize those risks. That's why commercial awareness is important. And I think a lot of students don't understand that. They think that commercial awareness is just knowing about what's happening in the financial world, what's going, you know, what latest trend, what, what latest trend, you know. That's true. That is true. But as you know, Stephanie, I have a three-pronged process on my teaching platform, which we'll talk about a little bit later. That's the first step. There are those two other key steps which many students, students don't understand, that it's about identifying risk and providing advice. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, so being a commercial lawyer with um, tw over 20 years experience working for investment banks and working in companies you know, in the city and um, in Mayfair as well, and as you explained earlier, you went from your um, degree to training contract. You clearly were able to become very commercial aware when practicing. But um, I just don't think that law students today, it's, it's not as, I'm not going to say easy, because I'm sure what you went through was not easy, worked for it. Um but for law students who aren't able to have that transition and become commercially aware through practice straight away, um, you have created lots of initiatives for students to become commercially aware. So um, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to talk about those now. Perhaps we could discuss BUCAC and um, if you could kindly explain what it is, share with us the reasons for launching it the wonderful opportunities that it has provided in recent years and what it holds for the future. So I, British, the BUCAC is the British Inter-University Commercial Awareness Competition. And that, I started it because when I started lecturing, so just let, let me just go back. So when I left the city, I was going to think about doing something, giving something back. And one of my friends happens to be a lecturer at a university, at a non-Russian university. And he invited me up to talk about commercial awareness because obviously having this business background, I knew something about what law lawyers, both in-house and private practice should be doing in terms of providing this uh, seamless service to their clients and having commercial awareness. And to my knowledge, it was just going to be an afternoon lecture. And I thought maybe I thought maybe 20 people would turn up and I would talk about this. Over 200 students filled the lecture hall. And they, after my lecture, they wanted more. They talked to this, the senior lecturer and he invited me back. And that's where this teaching started because I think there's this massive, um, a lot of law schools don't have or don't teach commercial awareness. So that's where I started uh, teaching commercial awareness. How did BUCAC arise? BUCAC arose because actually after one of my lectures, when I was lecturing on commercial awareness, I had a female student come up to me and started crying. And I said to her, what's the matter? And she said, and she was a straight A student, and she said, at a non-muscle, and she said that she manages to get uh, through the application process for some of these magic circle law firms and city law firms. But when it comes to the commercial awareness assessment center, she fails. And she couldn't understand why she kept on failing. And she gave me some examples of some of the things they discussed in this assessment center. And clearly the things they discussed or the case scenario they gave in these assessment centers to her were not covered by the law school. 
So she was on her own. And I thought, well, I need to do something because I, I thought that there's this, there's this pool of amazing students at non-Russell universities who sometimes are overlooked by some city law firms. And I think that's a really sad situation because the stats bear this out. 85% of city, grad, uh, city training contracts are awarded to Russell Group universities. 5% are foreign, such as Australians, Kiwis, uh, Irish, etc., leaving about only 10% for non-Russell student law students. That cannot be right because the non-Russell law schools compose about 80%, 80 to 85% of the law schools. Not the Russell group is only about 24. There's about there's about 80 odd non-Russell law schools. So the, the stats are completely the opposite way around. You know, 10% of graduates are getting jobs from non-Russell group universities in the city, and 85% and are coming from the Russell group. Well, there, there's something clearly wrong. And so I thought this can't be right, number one. Number two, I, I, I wanted to help the student and other students like her to be able to at least understand that commercial awareness is extremely important if you're going to succeed at an interview or an assessment centre at these city law firms. And it was a platform to basically do two things. A, highlight and give this opportunity to non-Russell students to showcase their talent directly to partners of city law firms because the judges in round four and the grand the semi-final and the grand final of the competition are partners of these law firms, some of the leading law firms in the world. That's one thing, so that the, so that partners can see the amazing talent at non-Russell. And the other thing was that it was able to showcase some of these law firms who, you know, for they don't they can't visit all law schools. The majority of these city law firms visit the the, the Russells, and in fact, they visit they visit about eight or nine not Russells. They don't visit all the Russells. They, they really target, I'm not going to name them, but I think we could all name the ones that they're going to go to. And so it's a way for these other law firms to show, say, look, you know, apply to us. You know, if you are in Hull, if you are in Aberdeen, if you are in Card um, Swansea, if you are anywhere else in the country, you should be applying to these law firms. And so it's a, it's a two-way process. It's a, it's a way for the students to showcase the talents of partners. And it's a way for these law firms to say, look, think about us when you apply, because we welcome, we welcome welcome applications from non-Russells. We want to employ non-Russells and you should think about it. So that's where BUCAC evolved and that's the sort of purpose of BUCAC. Before we get into the second half of the episode, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about the sponsors of today's show and the law school that I chose to study my LPC at and that's the University of Law. The University of Law believes in training students for the real world from the moment they accept a place. Their experienced career service and award-winning pro bono clinics offer students the chance to get real-life experience from the start. They offer a range of postgraduate legal training and master's degrees designed by qualified experts to help students advance at any stage of their career. Their courses are employment-focused, honing key skills in a teaching environment based on real legal practice. Part-time and online study options are also available on many of their courses to help students work and study at the same time. To find out more about the courses on offer, click the link in the description box of the podcast. What I really like about BUCAC is it not only provides fantastic, you know, prizes for the overall winners, but, you know, it's it's getting that um, publicity out there and making them more of a conversation um, between, you know, law firms um, and highlighting the fact that, you know, non-Russell group students should be considered but it also is it also offers fantastic mini prizes if you like for the uh for the rounds leading up to uh the finale which is fantastic because you know there's so many of those that are up for grabs but you know even if you're not a winner of one of those prizes if you like you can't put a price on commercial awareness. So, you know, if you're involved in BUCAC, you are going to walk away with something, um, whether that is a physical, you know, prize, um, doesn't matter. You know, commercial awareness is what we are all aiming for, right? I agree with that, Stephanie. I think 
every single student at non Russell University should do the competition in UK. Why? Because as you said, if there are five rounds, even if you don't get, you just do round one and you don't get through round two, well, guess what? You're still a winner because it's, in, yeah. it's, in, it's increased your commercial awareness and it's made you hopefully inspired you to say, well, next year I, I'm going to go in the competition and I'm going to do better. Because yes. of course, that's the whole purpose of this, to raise commercial awareness, to raise the awareness of commercial awareness and to get students to practice. Now, in rounds four and rounds five, as I said, in round four, it's online and round five, the final, the semi-final and the grand final last year were in person and this year will be in person. You get the opportunity, if you get to that stage, to perform and to answer questions and make presenta- presentations directly to some of the partners, some of the leading partners of the leading law firms in the world. We have we, Last year, we had 20-odd uh, sponsors from uh, the city, uh, city law firms, which I'm very grateful for, some of the leading law firms of the world, and... Some of the prizes are vacation schemes. Mm. You can win a vacation scheme. You can win a golden ticket to an assessment center for a training contract. You can win work experience to some of these amazing law firms. You can, and most of the prizes include some element of meeting graduate recruitment for a discussion about your CV review, interview practice, graduate guidance. Where else can you get a one-to-one discussion with a graduate recruitment team or some of the leading law firms in the world? Nowhere. So you should all be going for this because there, it's amazing. It's an amazing opportunity. Having said that, um, for the, we did it. We launched it in 2020. 2021 was the second year, and obviously this year is the third year. Some of the winners from 2020 have gained training contracts because of their prizes at Bucac. Now, that's a fantastic result. So I would encourage every single non Russell student to do it and to compete in this year's competition in Bucac 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, I may also add that I, I do think that students who aren't necessarily pursuing a career, you know, as a commercial lawyer, um, it's also beneficial for them I spoke to a family lawyer about commercial awareness and um, she said, you know, although you're not having to read you know, the, the, the front page of the FT every single day, you still have to be aware with um, tax things that are going on. And that's all part of commercial awareness as well. So, yeah, definitely, um, definitely worth all our students getting involved in. Um, So moving on now to the future city lawyers. Now, for our listeners, again, who are unfamiliar with future city lawyers, can you please just share the purpose of the platform and explain what the courses and academy offer, please? So when I was when I was running UCAC the first year, uh, we had, you know, we had to some of our lectures, we had hundreds and hundreds of students turning up. It was all online. It was during the COVID lockdown. So there was lots of in fact, we ran as part of UCAC, we ran a week of where I was I was lecturing for free. And we had partners from the sponsors of UCAC coming to give lectures on commercial awareness. We had some some days we had over a thousand students on Zoom listening to us talk about it. And so what I was getting from that was that students were staying at the end of those lectures and asking me to come and lecture at their universities. And I do lecture at some universities. I lecture at non-Russell and Russell, including Exeter, Liverpool, uh, Essex, City, Burbank, and other other, uh, uh, law schools. But I can't teach it. I just cannot teach at 40 or 50 law schools. It's impossible for me to do that. So that's where Future City Lawyers came about it was it was it's a, a it, I do have to charge the client as students for the courses but it's a way for students who don't have access to any teaching of commercial awareness because we'll come back to that teaching of commercial awareness is extremely important and we'll come back to this in a minute um, it's a way for them if their law school is not able to get to you know hire me or other people to come and talk about not just talk about teach, there's a difference between talking and teaching commercial awareness, uh, then they can come on Future City Lawyers and undertake the courses there. We run two courses there. We run an introductory course, and then we run the academy, the Commercial Awareness Academy. Uh, And so obviously the introductory course is as the name suggests. If you don't have any commercial awareness knowledge, that's the one you should undertake. And then to build upon that, you should then maybe, if you want to do to do the Commercial Awareness Academy, that's much more intense and much more longer. It's a full five-week course and five days of that. Um, so, And as you know, Stephanie, in my teaching, there are too many people out there. There are too many platforms out there. There are too many Instagram accounts out there who just talk about commercial awareness. 
talking about commercial awareness is just the first step. We should talk about it. You should read about it. You should read the FT, the BBC business page, et cetera. And there are lots of platforms out there, lots of free platforms out there who do a fantastic job in doing that. But that is not enough because that in itself will not get you to practice these case studies or assessment center type questions. Uh, to my knowledge, I am the only one, I'm the only person out there who does this. I always do a lecture followed by a case study, a group exercise where students are given a certain case, a, a facts, a hypothetical facts, and they then are split, split up into groups and then they come back and they actually do the task or undertake the task. It's a bit like, as I always say to students, it's a bit like riding a bike, learning to ride a bike. You can read all the books about riding a bike. You can listen to people talk about how to ride a bike. But until you get on the bike and actually ride it yourself, you'll never learn to ride a bike. The same with a commercial awareness. You can listen to people speak about it. And I would encourage you to do that. But I'd also encourage you to then think, well, actually, I need to try this myself. And I would then encourage you to do these group exercises or case studies. And then in my uh, in my courses, as I think you know, Stephanie, because mm -hmm. I think you came to one and I think you were slightly in shock at what I do, I give direct, honest feedback. Why do I do that? A, because I'm Australian. We, we, that's how we are. We just we that sort of we just do that. We just give honest, direct feedback. But secondly, more importantly, I always say to my students, isn't it better that you make the mistake with me? make the mistake with me, learn from that mistake so that you don't make that mistake in front of a partner or a graduate recruitment in an assessment center or interview. That's my job. My job is to increase your commercial awareness to uh, then test it. You know, if you give me an answer and I don't think it's, you know, totally correct, I would ask, I will stop you and ask you, what do you mean by this term? Why did you say that? That's the way you can improve your commercial awareness through actual practical experience. Yeah, I agree. I do think that um, doing is much better than, you know, discussing. Actually, say that discussing is great because it's doing as well, but talk, just talking about it, it does help a lot. It makes you think and it makes you generate ideas. Um, and I do really like your style of teaching. I think that, you know, students are there for a reason. And if you're not going to offer constructive criticism if you like um, or be direct with them there's little point in you being there but but you know as I say to students you only have that 10 minute or 20 minutes or 30 minutes you've got in front of a partner of a law firm to impress them there are no second chances there are no second chances and you've got to be on your best a game when you go and see that partner or that graduate recruitment and how can you do that if you've not practiced it before it's just one of those things you know it's like going to lots of interviews the first interview will be terrible but you get to, if you get to the seventh or eighth interview you are much more comfortable much more confident much more calmer in the answers you give it's mm -hmm. the same with commercial awareness and that's why i sometimes look at all these other instagram uh, and other platforms and i just think Yes, you can listen to someone talk about it. Firstly, always ask who's talking? Who's talking? Who's talking about commercial awareness? Is it a qualified lawyer with many years' experience, or is it somebody with not qualified, no qualifications? You know, uh, who, uh, that's the question you need to ask. Yeah. But also, it's great to listen, but I think you do need to undertake these exercises. And as I said, I, I do firmly believe in these case studies and group exercises as the real way to learn commercial awareness. It's very labor intensive, it's not pre recorded, it's live. You're under, you're under time constraint, you are under time constraint just like an assessment center you are under pressure just like an assessment center because there's no point otherwise if we had seven hours to do one question there would be no point in that you know you've got 20 or 30 minutes to do it and that's mimicking the assessment centers yeah so you've talked about the introduction course and the um, academy is two, two different who can benefit from which course uh, you know as um somebody or give an example, somebody who has, I don't know, been working on their commercial awareness for, say, I don't know, a year. Do you think they should jump in um, into academy courses or 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 break themselves in with an introduction? So uh, we 
so there, as I said, there's the introductory course and the academy. But before I go on to the difference between the two, we do run free webinars. So I do some free webinars and you're all very welcome to come along to those. And so you can maybe test your knowledge in those free webinars. We all, and I will come to this, some law firms have now come on board, Future City Lawyers. In the last two months, three months, we have um, Wide and Case, uh, Freshfield to come on board, Hogan Lovells. And so they are now, their partners are giving these free webinars and we we're about to do something else with one of those, which is a big announcement coming up in two days' time. So I can't talk much about that, but there's a big, big thing we're going to do with a, one of the big law firms in, with Future City Lawyers. And so again, I think I'm, I think I can say that I am one of the only platforms out there actually having law firms coming on board and actually doing these things with us, which I think is brilliant. So to answer your question. If you come to some of these webinars and if you feel confident in what's being discussed, and you pretty and you and then you know if you if you if you think you've got that, then you should maybe come and do the Commercial Awareness Academy. If you think you have, you know, you need more knowledge, you you, you have a pretty basic understanding of commercial awareness, uh, then you definitely should do the introductory. So the introductory is aimed at people who have no commercial awareness or a basic commercial awareness knowledge. That's the introductory one. Uh, and then if you if you feel confident, if you've come to some of, my web, some of my webinars, free ones, and you think that you understand what's going on, then you could come along and do the academy, the five day, the five week course over five days. Well, thank you for explaining that. And um, I'm starting to regret booking this interview with you on this date. If only we held off for another two days, I would have um, have that information. You'd have, you had you'd it have the exclusive. Here first, the student lawyer <laughs> You had the exclusive. You had the exclusive. I mean, it is it is it is big news. It is big news. I, I mean, I, I and I'm very honoured and privileged that this law firm has agreed to do this with uh, with Future City Lawyers. Uh, I think it's amazing. And so please keep an eye on our Instagram or, or LinkedIn profiles. We're going to make an announcement very shortly. Uh, yes. Thank you. And, you know, thank you for setting all these things up. It's It takes, you know, real dedication and determination to keep these conversations moving and getting people involved and keeping them engaged. And I just think it's a really fantastic thing that you're doing. So um, keep it up, Dennis. Thank you, Stephanie. And I, and I want to thank the law firms because, you know, without the law firms supporting me, none of this would be possible. So I do want to thank all the law firms. But I, I want to say this, and I want to say this on record. If you are interested in a city career, you can do it. All of you can do it. All of you can do it. You just have to have the right skill set, okay? And that takes, as Stephanie knows, that takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication. But the rewards are amazing. And I think you can do it. So don't be put off. Don't be put off. You know, you may fall down on a few hurdles. Just pick yourself up and keep on going because you will get there. But you mustn't fool yourself. That's what I want to make sure. Do not fool yourself that by just sitting back and listening to some other people talk about commercial awareness, that that somehow magically is going to do it. That's not going to cut it. You have to be able to prove that you can do and understand commercial awareness. And you have to prove that in an assessment center. And it's not about you listening to you know lots of other people. It's actually about doing, as we discussed before. So when um, future city lawyers are not uh, you know, taking part in one of your courses, in their day-to-day -day life, how do you advise they keep up um, developing their commercial awareness? That's a very good question. I get that question. I get asked that question many, many times. So it, it's back to that first part of the three-pronged uh, uh, situation or learning process of commercial awareness. You have to, of course, be knowledgeable about what's going on. So I'd always recommend if you, I'd always, and I do this myself, it's very basic, but very good. It's the BBC uh, business pages every morning you know every morning even on a Saturday even on a Sunday yes I know I just have a quick glance and see if I can read about a story that's happening and so that's a good start so at least you must do that you must read the BBC or other other news uh, news uh, services out there about some business topics you can advance them to the FT or the Economist that are slightly more complicated but again you should be you should be reading articles on FT frequently if you know there are lots of podcasts out there are lots of resources out there that are totally free I always recommend you know the, the websites uh, little law little law is very good mm -hmm. um, the business update another good one they're all run by law students who do a fantastic job totally free and they summarize and contextualize stories about business stories which I think is brilliant so I think that's at a minimum you have to start reading now why is that important it's not only important for you to be able to keep up to date but guess what guys 
who are the partners who will be interviewing you? What do they read? They read that stuff. They read that stuff on a daily basis. And I'm going to be harsh now. They are unlikely to talk about to talk to you in the interview about your TikTok video you made, you jumping up and down, or about the latest trend on some other on some other uh, social media platform. They will talk to you or expect you to know about stories that they or their law firm's interested in. And that's why it's important that you do know about this. So, so you have something to talk to them about if they ask you about some topic. You could always bring in an interesting story that you recently read on that topic, be it oil and gas, be it ESG, be whatever it is. You'll only be able to do that if you keep up with the news and read these stories. Yeah, and I think keeping up with it is so important to you you know I found it actually quite difficult to read an article in the FT when I first started my um first started my journey into law but I just kept on going and going and going and although I have always enjoyed you know reading what is going on in the business world even when it was extremely difficult to understand in that first article the more I kept going, the more enjoyable it became. And I came to, uh, well, it just confirmed that this was the right um, career for me to go in. And, you know, you you joke about like reading it on the Saturday and the Sunday. I love tuning into the FT um, briefing on the Saturday. Now they do on a Saturday, but it's more kind of um, uh, cultural trends. So, Keep on going, as you said. You'll get better. It will all be worth it. it it'll all be worth it. It'll be, and of course, like you rightly say, the first time, I, the first time I read an article in the FT, I was like, "Whoa, this is so complicated. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand some of these words." And of course, that is perfectly natural. Nothing to be a frightened of. Nothing to be ashamed of. If there are words you don't understand, there's technical jargon, the you know, uh, either legalistic or more importantly, commercial or economic terms. Stop, just go and Google it, look up yeah. that word and see what does it mean? What does it mean, that word? And and then, of course, as you said, Stephanie, the more you read, the better you get. What really impresses partners is that you're able to discuss something, a commercial topic or, or a case or, or, or a transaction that's happening and able to use the language in the correct context and the correct meaning. There's nothing worse than you trying to use jargon and the partner stops you and says, which I do frequently with my students, I stop. I say, could you explain that? If you cannot explain that in your own words, it means that you don't understand it. Yeah. At that point, the partner thinks, mm, this student doesn't really understand it. And that goes back to my point about these case studies that I do. In a case study, when you do it and you come back and you answer the questions in front of me, I will stop you halfway through and say, you've used that word. What do you mean by that? And so it's always that testing, testing and improving so satisfying though when you come to the end of it and you can do it it's so good just keep on going keep on going um so how should uh, future city lawyers who have secured a trading contract now adapt well should they adapt their approach in developing their commercial awareness or um should they just you know carry on with what they've been doing so my advice to you as, a, as obviously as a former head of legal is that commercial awareness is something that you will have for the rest of your careers. You have to improve upon that because there'll be new legal developments, new commercial developments, new transactions. And if you're not up to speed, just put yourself in a room with a client and the client asks you about a transaction or a deal that he or she's read in the FT and you have no clue about it. You look silly. You look silly, your law firm looks silly, your partner's embarrassed that you don't know about it. You do need to keep up to date. So you do have to continue to read the FT because don't forget you're in a competitive world. If law firm X is doing a new deal with a company A, a company A, company B comes along and says, well, I like what company A did. Can your law firm do what company X is? If you don't know about that, your law firm looks silly, you look silly. So, of course, you've got to keep up with all the, the recent things and the developments. It's, it's an on, 20 years on, I'm still learning about commercial awareness. In fact, I'm getting involved in something else at the moment. It's a brand new topic for me, a brand new set that I didn't know anything about. And it's, so, yes, we, you've, got to, you've got to continue to read the FT, read, uh, read as much as possible, and, and be inquisitive. Be inquisitive about other... 
there will be, there will be nothing more impressive that if you come in one morning to your partner as a two or three A qualified and you say, I read this other transaction on this other, on, you know, whatever platform or FT. Why don't we as a law firm start specializing or getting more expertise in that area? Because I can see it a growing sector and we should maybe go and target company A, B, C and D about this. That's what it's about. It's about showing how innovative and differentiating, trying to differentiate your law firm from all the other law firms out there. So, yes, you've just got to keep on going with it. Well, thank you for um, giving your advice on that. So going back now before you secure a, a training contract, what are your top three interview tips? <laughs> I always get this. I get this question a lot as well. And so I did think about this when you gave me the list of questions, Stephanie. I think the first the first thing, the first one is, and, and you know, <laughs> uh, a lot of students will be uh, slightly shocked at what I'm about to say. You know, you get a lot of things saying, be yourself, be yourself. Mm. Yeah, that's the advice that some people say, be yourself. My advice is be yourself, but remember who you're speaking to. You're not speaking to your mates at a pub. You're not speaking to your mum. You're not speaking to your boyfriend or girlfriend. You are speaking to, you know, a 55, 60 year old partner. He or she in the law firm has been there for 30 years and they are very experienced and very knowledgeable about the work. Think about who you're addressing. So that's the first thing. Of course, be yourself. No one's saying you should pretend to be somebody else, but be yourself in the context of you are trying to get a job at this law firm. You, the competition is really fierce out there. The competition is huge. And so you've got to be what you've got to be what they're looking for now that's that's difficult you know, lots of law firms look for different things in lots of different candidates but you've got to be roughly in the ballpark figure you've got to be what they're looking for and that does that does uh, it does involve an element of being somebody else in the sense that you have to be professional that's what i'm putting that's a probably better way of expressing it you have to be professional and to be professional there is a sort of baseline of professionalism so you have to go up to that line and because your partners and your clients will expect you to be professional they won't expect you to be yourself in the sense that they won't expect you to come along wearing a beanie or a you know a cool cat and you know in the you know in showing them what skateboarding tricks you can do no one's asking you to do that you have to then, t- you have to be professional and, and give them a seamless professional service, just like you would expect of your, of your doctor, of your, of your plumber, well, maybe not your plumber, maybe your, maybe your hairdresser, your beautician. There are certain things that you have to expect to be professional and the same with the legal sector. So that's my first tip. Second tip, please, please research the law firm you're going to go the interview. You know, please understand the law firm. And that's not just about, you know, oh, you know, this law firm does M&A or this law firm does banking. It's got to go much deeper than that. It's got to go, you've got to understand all the departments. Why is that important? Because they may ask you a question about what services can our, our law firm give a potential client. And if you don't know all the divisions or the departments, you look pretty silly. If you just know that they've got a banking department or a litigation department and there are lots of other departments, well, clearly you don't profess to know that law firm. So my, my point is, Lots of law firms these days tell me, and I speak to graduate recruitment a lot, that they want you to to convince the partner that that you want to work for that law firm. Not for law firm B or law firm C or law firm D, for their law firm. And you need to know about their law firm. You need to convince them that you want to work at their law firm. And so I do think you need to look at the, the departments, the partners involved, if you can, if you know some of the big partners, and their clients. What sort of work do they do? Who are they working for? Are they working for small startups? Are they working for big oil or national international oil and gas companies? What are they doing? So you need to know all that stuff. So that's my second tip. Please, please research the law firms a lot. And it, I know it takes time. I know it takes time. And it's, you know, you're doing lots of applications. But put yourself in the law firm's position. If they see a candidate who knows their law firm very well and is and you know is, has immersed themselves in the law firm, that can only get you positive things. You can only do positive. So try to do that. And the third thing, and this is the third thing, don't ask law firms what they can do for you. Tell law firms what you can do for them. Now, 
I know that lots, I do come across a lot of students who tend to think about what, you know, they ask about the culture of the law, of the law firm, what the law firm can do. I mean, I had some students ask me that they would ask a partner, you know, what's their, what's their career progression in that law firm? Those are all important questions which you can either research on their website or you can go to different other uh, uh, online platforms. You can find lots of information. For all. I don't think you should be asking that partner of those questions. I think you need to market yourself. I think you need to tell the law firm, if you get the opportunity, what you can bring to the law firm. Now, I know that some of you are you know, still law students, and that, but you've got to think about how you can help that law firm prosper as a business and what you would do if you were employed in that law firm. That's hard. That's really hard. So I think that's the focus. Don't, don't ask so many questions about what the law firm can do for you. What is it that you can bring to the law firm? What would you like to do if you get a job at the law firm? And I think that definitely, definitely will stand you out from the crowd because too many students focus on what the law firm can do for them. That, that's my three tips. Absolutely incredible advice. You know, somebody who has just been through the interview process, I would just like to um, assure listeners that everything that Dennis has just said, you know, is very valuable and I would really take it on board because you just, you, it's very important that you um, have all that down and have exactly what the law firm does um, on the, you know, the ready to roll off the tongue. And don't forget, Stephanie. So this is where this is where I said uh, a minute ago. I said always ask who's talking about commercial awareness. To whom are you listening to when you go to you, when you go to these webinars or these other you know Instagram posts? Who is it that's talking? Is it someone who's either not a qualified lawyer, or someone who's just one or two years ahead of you, or is it someone who, like me, has spent many years interviewing lawyers, interviewing bankers, you know, doing this? So I think I know a little bit, a little bit about how interviews work and what you need to do. And is it someone who's working with law firms or is it someone who's not look, working with law firms? I think it's very valuable to just ask that question of yourself when you listen to someone speak. Who is this person? What experience do they have? Have they run a department? Have they run a uh, legal department? Have they run? Have they worked as a partner, a law firm? Who are they? And if the answer is no, then you've got to think, hmm, do they really know what law firms or what interviewing is like? Because they probably have never done it. I've, you know, I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lawyers and other bankers and professionals over my years. So I do think I know a little bit about interviewing. Um, I think you know more than a little bit, Dennis. <laughs> now, just moving on, unfortunately, to my last question, unfortunately for me anyway, um, and the listeners, would you be able to give us any last words of wisdom that you have for us today? You, you know... You know, I'm, I'm a newbie on the block in some respects. You know, there are people out there who've been doing it many long, many more years than I have. I've only been doing, you know, teaching and, and working with law students for the last couple of years. I'm going to say this. My last tip is that, guys, you, all of you, I would firstly recommend a, if you have any interest in the commercial world, I would strongly recommend a career at a city or a, a commercial institution. That's, you know, don't be put off. It's not, it's not what you think it is. It's much more rewarding. You get to deal with some amazing people on some amazing transactions and deals, and you have a fantastic career ahead of you. So that's the first thing. And the, and the second thing is every one of you, if you have that aspiration, look at me a poor country boy from the outback in the middle of nowhere. You would not believe where I grew up. You would not believe where I grew up. I mean, in the literally in the middle of nowhere. So look at me, you know, as somebody who came to this country and, and has done, you know, auditory okay, you know, done okay. But I think my, my point is you guys have a golden opportunity here. Here you are being educated in some of the best universities in the world, both Russell and non-Russell. I'm going to say that some, you know, some fantastic universities. You can definitely do it. You just got to make sure that you open your eyes. It does, as Stephanie said, it does take work. Unfortunately, it does take work. But if you prepare to work and do and fall, you know, you will fall sometimes and pick yourself up, dust yourself off and keep on going. You are the, 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 the city will welcome you and you will do a fantastic and you have a fantastic career. One of the one of the leading financial centers of the world. So I would encourage you all to do that. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing all of your fantastic advice. Um, I have had an 
I've had a really good time chatting with you today. Um, and I just want to say thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. And I hope your listeners are, have learned something about a, the importance of commercial awareness and obviously what I'm trying to do. But thank you very much, Stephanie. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. We will see you back here next time. Thanks, everybody. This episode is sponsored by the University of Law. What really sets the University of Law apart from other universities is its belief that its students should learn in a realistic, professional and contemporary context. They focus exclusively on practice-based training and give students access to their extensive career service and jobs vacancy database as soon as they accept a place. Through the University of Law's pro bono program, law students can hone their skills by working on real cases before they graduate. The University of Law offers a range of postgraduate legal training and master's degrees designed by qualified experts to help students advance at any stage of their career. Their courses are employment focused, honing key skills in a teaching environment based on real legal practice. Part-time and online study options are also available on many of their courses to help students work and study at the same time. The University of Law will help you reach your ambitions by delivering an outstanding academic and employment focused experience, honing key skills in a teaching environment based on real legal practice. As soon as you begin your studies with U Law, you'll learn how to think and act like a lawyer. Whether your aspirations are in law or other fields, their courses will balance academic rigour and practical skills so your career starts from day one. To find out more about the courses they have on offer, just click the link in the description box of the podcast. To hear more of the Student Lawyers podcast, hit the subscribe button and leave us a star rating and review. If you would like to join the Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com.